Hello, and welcome to the Pope Francis Generation, the show for Catholics struggling with the church's teaching, who feel like they may not belong in the church anymore, but who still hunger for a God of love and goodness. We're taking a look at the Catholic Church, her teachings, and her practices from three views that have changed our world. And those are the Kerygma, the Doctrine of Theosis, and the teachings of Pope Francis. Your hosts are me, Paul Fahey, a professional catechist. And normally Dominic would be here, but he unfortunately isn't able to join us. Uh, it's, uh, today we're talking with, or I'm talking with, um, Deacon Stephen Gradanus, um, and we're talking about how to appreciate decent movies. Deacon, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So uh, for Deacon's bio, um, um, Deacon Gradanus has been writing about film since 2000 when he created Decent Films. Since then, he's written... He's a regular contributor for a number of outlets, including the National Catholic Register, Catholic Digest, Crux, Christianity Today, Catholic World Report. Other bylines include uh, RogerEbert.com, Slate, Brightwall Darkroom, and Our Sunday Visitor. For 18 years, he wrote regularly for the National Catholic Register and was their film critic for nearly 11 years. His work at the Register was recognized several times by the Catholic Media Association Awards. Uh, he's a, a member of the New York Film Critics Circle and a deacon in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Newark. He studied at the School of Visual Arts, St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, and Immaculate Conception Seminary at Seton Hill University. He and his wife, Suzanne, have seven children. Deacon, thank you for joining me. Again, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. I, <laughs> I appreciate the uh, um, the angle of your ministry, um, uh, I'm trying to offer... Um, uh, an, an opening to to faith and to the church for people who may feel uh, at least somewhat estranged from it. And, and that's part of what I try to do in my work. Excellent. I'm super thrilled to have you on. Um, I first I first started following your work probably about uh, a decade ago. Um, you're someone who uh, in in your public facing persona, I who I've admired quite a bit. Um, you're one of the few Catholic public figures on Facebook I've felt uh, able to freely recommend to people without any hesitation. Uh, you model what constructive and charitable conversations can look like on social media. Um, and as someone who, uh, as someone who has been a part of of the pro-life movement my whole life, but someone who also deeply cares about the church's social teaching. Uh, you helped create, make me feel like there's a space in the church for me over the past uh, six or eight years um, in the US Catholic landscape. Um, but the reason I followed you in the first place was because you're a movie reviewer. And years ago, uh, you were the first Catholic movie reviewer who was able to help me think deeper about movies instead of being focused on being moralistic about uh, the content of movies. Um, so I'm happy to have you on. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your story about how you became a movie critic and why that's important to you. Wow. Okay. So um, <laughs> just let, let, I, I have to say that I am both gratified and humbled twice over. Um, first, by the suggestion that I had anything to do with anyone feeling that they have a place in the church today. And then also that I have helped anyone to think more deeply and less moralistically about movies. Those are both causes, you might say, um, that are very dear to my heart. Um, you know, I am. I, I think I, you're I doing them well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'm certainly aware of the phenomenon of religious gatekeepers in American Catholicism and of the moral rigorism and scrupulosity, the excessive scrupulosity uh, that many believers bring to popular culture in general and to movies in particular. Um, this is something that I have tried to provide an antidote for in my own work. Um, I've, I've often said that um, the, the focus of my writing as a Catholic film critic is, on the one hand, to try to suggest to my more pious readers that there might be value in watching an R-rated movie or a subtitled movie other than The Passion of the Christ, <laughs> while at the same time also suggesting to 
um, uh, mainstream readers, to secular readers, that a Christian doesn't necessarily have to be a censorious fundamentalist nut job uh, to have theological problems with a movie like The Last Temptation of Christ. I felt all my life as if I have one foot in each of these two worlds, and I see myself attempting to kind of bridge that gap and kind of translate uh, and help them understand one another. Yeah. Um, the, and like I, yeah, like I said, that has very much been my experience. Um, yeah, you're someone who I valued because you have Catholic values and you have a Catholic worldview, um, which is different than uh, a non-Catholic or a non-Christian worldview. Uh, and you're able to bring that into an analysis of popular movies that I found really valuable. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you bridge that gap very well. So thank you. Um, I can't imagine there are many children who grow up wanting to be film critics. Uh, so uh, you recently wrote a review about uh, the Indiana Jones movies, and you talked yes. about how the role of the first Indiana Jones movie uh, played in your own love of movies. But yeah, um, I'd, I'd love to hear more of the story. How uh, where did the desire to become a film critic come from? Sure. Um, so in, in that in that piece, this is a kind of an epic piece that I wrote for Catholic World Report on all of the Indiana Jones movies and why Raiders of the Lost Ark, in my opinion, just stands head and shoulders above all of the others. And I talked about the explosive significance that this movie had on my consciousness when it opened in theaters when I was 12 years old. And I was already a cinema kid. I went to the theaters a lot. I had seen... I, I saw a lot of movies as a child, um, but but Raiders of the Lost Ark hit me a different way. Um, you know, when I watched the Star Wars movies, I wanted to be Luke Skywalker. But when I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, I didn't want to be Indiana Jones. I wanted to make Indiana Jones. I wanted to film Indiana Jones. I watched a lot of movies obsessively, but I studied Raiders of the Lost Ark. I watched how Steven Spielberg put together shots, how he composed action sequences. I was I was fascinated, and and it. I went through a number of years where I I, I was kind of a bit by the filmmaking bug, and I had I made grand plans to make a. a an Indiana Jones spoof, uh, starring my uncle, driving his truck. I had an uncle who had a pickup truck that would have worked very well in a Raider spoof. I never made that movie. I did make, um, I shot a few scenes of a science fiction um, satire called Cyborg. I was the cyborg. I was a renegade robot. Um, and, you know, there were some special effects. It was, it was okay. Long since lost to history and the world is no poorer. Um, but but my enthusiasm for movies soon brought me to watching Roger Eber and Gene Siskel uh, on television debating movies. And that was really an important um, turning point in my life. When I went to the School of Visual Arts um, and, and studied media arts, I took some film history classes. I took history of animation. Um, and then after I graduated and uh, my wife, Suzanne, and I got married and then we became Catholic, um, um, I went to seminary to study uh, religious studies. I thought I was maybe going to wind up either going into teaching in Catholic schools or possibly go on and do doctoral work in biblical studies. And then um, a, a friend, Jimmy Aiken, who works for uh, Catholic Answers oh, yeah. uh, in 2000, yeah. um, he, he, we were talking on the phone one day and he said, you know, we're looking for guests for our show and you've studied movies and art and you studied religion. Would you like to come on Catholic Answers and talk about movies from a faith-based point of view. And I said, I would love it. And um, six months later, I had a website, Decent Films. And three years later, I was writing for the National Catholic Register. And the rest is history. Oh, man. So what about... Um, or what about watching the old movie reviewers when you were uh, a kid? Like, what about that was really compelling to you, drew you in? So... Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel pioneered a new type of film criticism, which had never been done before. Um, many, I, I, I'm again gratified and humbled to say that 
many people have compared my writing style to Roger Ebert, and it's certainly true that he's been a major influence on me and my literary voice. And the fact that he had a Catholic background himself and that his Catholicism, his background Catholicism, lapsed Catholicism, occasionally emerged into his reviews was certainly a part of it. Although when I began watching and reading him, I was not Catholic myself. Um, but but they they did something that had never been done before. They created a, a a populist space in which discussion around movies was as much of a draw as the movies themselves. Um, you know, in in the past, uh, there have been uh, literary uh, uh, film critics, in, including Catholic film critics. Uh, Graham Greene, the novelist, uh, was a film mm -hmm. critic for a number of years. Um, there have been uh, other other important Catholic film critics, but they were writing for more a more literary audience. And, and what drew me in was that this was a vital discussion. It was just a discussion that uh, all kinds of people were interested in. And, and I've, I, although my own style of writing is, is maybe a little more um, academic and, uh, and at, at a, um, it's some, some people have found a, a little bit of a barrier to entry to reading my writing, but I am, I am, am trying to have a conversation with as wide an audience as possible, ranging from believers to unbelievers and everybody in between. Yeah, so that brings me to my next question, which is, um, I mean, I enjoy talking about movies. Often my own discussions of movies uh, are pretty surface level, um, which is why I, I like your writing, be because it helps me see deeper themes and deeper things going on. Um, I love going to movies. I've always loved going to the theater. Some of my best memories as a kid is going to the theater. Um, we have a small, uh, a small town the theater about 25 minutes from us. And the summer, especially, my kids are now old enough and it's after COVID. I've been able to take them to the movies uh, more this summer than I have in a long time. And I love being able to do that. Um, but other than it being fun, what about what do you see about movies that's really important and valuable? Like, how do you see movies making the world a better place? And how do you see movies making me individually, like people better in any way? Well, to start with, let, let's not overlook the value of fun, <laughs> uh, of, of unwinding at the end of a long day of, of relaxation and, and recreation. Um, in the very first papal document, um, dedicated to the motion picture. Um, Vi Vigilante Cura of Pope Pius XI in 1936, um, he, he calls recreation, quote, a, ne a necessity for people who work under the fatiguing conditions of modern industry. Um, and, and taking a step beyond that, one of my favorite Catholic documents on movies, uh, which came about 20 years later, um, is a pair of 1955 addresses by Pope Pius XII to Italian film professionals, uh, addresses sometimes called the ideal film. And in this document, um, the Pope uh, acknowledges that movies can provide modern man in the evening of what he calls his crowded or monotonous day. Um, he can, can provide him with entertainments that the Pope says can calm the spirit even if they remain on the surface not penetrate very deeply, um, that they bring relief to his state of weariness, they banish his boredom, and as long as it um, avoids what the Pope calls vulgarity and unseemly sensationalism, uh, he says that even shallow entertainments can rise to high artistic levels and be classed as ideal. Since, and, and I love this, this is, this is one of the guiding light posts in my, in my um, engagement with film, man has shallows as well as depths. <laughs> so, <laughs> and when I hear that, this, this particular Pope, Pius XII, is known to have had a special fondness for the 1944, I think, um, Oscar winner, um, Going My Way with Bing Crosby as, as a, uh, a somewhat hip progressive Catholic priest. Um, not a profound entertainment, but one that certainly was part of the 1940s cool Catholicism um, that, that helped to mainstream Catholicism in American society and bring it kind of out of the ghetto. Um, and not, so, so yeah, um, but, but, but Pius XII doesn't stop there. Um, he goes on to articulate a theory of the ideal in film, which he says is 
realized to the extent that film measures up to the original and essential demands of man himself, which he classifies as truth, goodness, and beauty. Yeah. So, and, and for him, for the Pope, truth, goodness, and beauty are what he calls rays of God, um, or in a, in a more elevated language, he, he describes them as refractions across the prism of consciousness of the boundless realm of being that extends beyond man in whom they actuate an ever more extensive participation in being itself. So truth, goodness, and beauty speak to us about reality and of ultimate reality, ultimately of God himself. Um, so, another... Uh, so so uh, what you're saying is that I went and saw the new Mission Impossible movie a week or two ago, and I, I went into it expecting just to have a fun action movie, and that was exactly what I got. You're saying that what that Pope Pius the Twelfth is saying there's something of an encounter with God even in the shallow of a Mission Impossible film. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and that doesn't mean that a movie like that can't go beyond just that shallow entertainment. And 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 I do think, for example, that uh, Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning is a, a is a um, a potent example of this because when you look at the themes of what the movie is dealing with, and this is a movie that was made. Um, some time ago, it's been waiting to be released, and, and it comes out at a time when creatives in Hollywood are striking um, over a, a number of concerns, but among them is the concern that artificial intelligence uh, will eclipse human creative effort. So you'll have chatbots writing screenplay treatments and um, um, uh, AI synthespians replacing real human acting. Um, and 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 Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning is very much about um, the 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 danger to humanity of AI eclipsing reality. That that the rise of AI can potentially um, uh, blur truth into oblivion and redefine how we think about right and wrong. Um, so these are, I mean, these are real valid moral concerns that are being expressed in a, you know, in a fantastical way, in an action movie, in a way that's removed uh, several degrees from reality uh, by various imaginative conceits, uh, but but still a movie that that connects on an emotional level um, because of the the humanistic ethos in in the best sense of humanism um, at the center of the recent Mission Impossible movies. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Um... I like the part when he jumped off the cliff. Like that was, <laughs> um, uh, anyways, you were talking about, uh, you were going to say more about Pope Pius the 12th before I interrupted you. Um, I was actually going to go on and, and turn to a, a different commentator that we've already mentioned, Roger Ebert, um, who has proposed that perhaps the most important thing that a movie can do is to take us out of our personal box of time and space and invite us to empathize with those of other times, places, races, creeds, classes, and prospects. He says, I believe that empathy is the most essential quality of civilization. In another place, he says that movies are the most powerful empathy machine in all the arts. When I go to a great movie, I can live someone else's life for a while. I can walk in someone else's shoes. I can see what it feels like to be a member of a different gender, a different race, a different economic class, to live in a different time, to have a different belief. And this is, he says, a liberalizing influence on me. It gives me a broader mind. It helps me to join my family of men and women on this planet. It helps me to identify with them so that I'm not just stuck being myself day after day. He says the great movies enlarge us. They civilize us. They make us more decent people. Now, with all of that power to broaden us, movies also have the power to reinforce our prejudices, to uh, inflame our, um, our, our darker angels and, and, and lead us in, in bad directions. But it is certainly true that movies have the power to be, be part of the project of, of becoming more authentically human. And, and um, you know, um, uh, St. Edith Stein did her doctoral dissertation on empathy, and she talks about the importance of empathy, not only in terms of how it allows us to understand other people, but even in terms of how it allows us to understand ourselves, because we don't truly understand ourselves 
if we can't see ourselves from another person's point of view. And, and there's something about movies that allow us to do that. And there's enough of a distance. that's a little bit safe. Like there's a, there's a way to like uh, engage really only at the level that we're comfortable with. It's an invitation to empathy, not, not something that's coerced in any way. Um, I, uh, that, that passage you just read, I've never heard that before, but as you were reading it, I think about, how much my own moral imagination was shaped by movies like um, as an adolescent watching Schindler's List and Roots and Amistad. Um, yeah, like there are scenes from 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 those movies that uh, profoundly shaped my my moral formation in, into adulthood, um, which may or may not have been my parents' intentions when they took me to those movies, but uh, that's certainly what they did. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with you that it's, it's not a coercive thing. It is an invitation. Uh, many people do watch these movies and just completely shut down uh, any possibility for empathic connection. Um, they, they judge them from within their own ideological lenses, and, and they're really the poorer for it. it. It also helps, I think, to bear in mind that the invitation to empathy is not limited to the f characters and, and people that we see on screen uh, who may be real or, you know, in some cases, they may be fictional. Uh, but it's it's also an expression of the filmmaker's own inner world and their moral imagination. And so by, even if the story is completely fictional, even if it's fantastical, even if it takes place in worlds that don't exist involving, um, for, you know, properties of physics that could never really happen, you know, something like Star Wars, um, we're, we're still invited into the inner world of the filmmakers. And, and you know, there's, a, there's an act of self-disclosure from the writer, the director, the actors, um, and, and we enter into their world. And, and by doing so, we see our world in a slightly different way. So movies are an invitation to come out of ourselves in some way, uh, in a good way. Is, is, that, is that a fair summary of what you're saying? A good movie can do that. Again, I, I want to... I want to emphasize that there are there's there's always a flip side to any any question in the arts, and uh, a, a movie can also be an invitation to reject empathy. A movie can present us with a worldview that is insular and us against them, um, that invites us to have a vindictive or um, um, feelings of, of animosity toward outgroups, toward people who are different from us. Uh, it can tell us that we're the good guys and other people are the bad guys and um, um, inflame prejudice, uh, have, have all kinds of, of bad effects on us as well. Uh, so, so we do have to exercise some judgment in uh, which movies we watch and how we watch movies. And when we see a movie that, you know, may have many good qualities, but also has some bad qualities to learn to distinguish between the two, um, the way that you might go to a restaurant and they serve you a dish and it's got lots of good food on it. But, you know, maybe there's some gristle along with your steak and, uh, you know, you cut that off and you leave it on one side. You don't necessarily just take in everything that the movie offers you. Yeah. Yeah. So that was hits a main theme that that I wanted to talk with you about where I'm like thinking about my my own relationship with movies and um uh, I was raised uh uh I was homeschooled growing up um uh, raised catholic I was homeschooled from first through 12th grade um in through the 90s and into the, the early 2000s uh <laughs> actually last month I watched the documentary on uh on Amazon Prime uh, shiny happy people which, which is about the Duggar family and um, Bill Gothard evangelicalism. And uh, uh, I've joked with friends, I experienced the uh, LaCroix version of that. It's something that had hints of those elements, but certainly far from the experience of, like, of the Duggar family. In any case, part of what I experienced was a real sense of Christian media is safe 
in secular media is is unsafe. So I remember going to Christian bookstores a lot as a kid. We would listen to Christian music. We would watch Christian movies. Um, but secular movies, popular movies, were viewed with a kind of fear or suspicion where they were especially analyzed for bad content and specifically sexual content. Um, and that would determine if the movie was good or bad just by an, an analysis of content. And implicitly then, the kind of person who would watch that movie, if they were good or bad uh, as well, was in that judgment. And I recognize that's not healthy. It took a long time into young adulthood for me to recognize that. Um, but I also recognize that just passive consumption of media isn't healthy either. So how can Catholics engage with movies in a way that's uh, healthy and mature, in a way that's critical, but in a way that isn't fearful? So first of all, just on, a, on an autobiographical note, my experience was somewhat different from yours. As, as you've already heard, I, I grew up as a, um, a, a movie theater kid. Uh, I did see a lot of movies when I was a kid. My parents were not super scrupulous about um, the dangers of secular movies. Music, oddly, was was a different story. And it wasn't so much my parents as the church environment that I was exposed to, because my mom, my mother did listen to uh, quite a bit of secular music herself. But I grew up with an ethos that the music that I wanted to listen to was like Christian rock. And, and I was... Um, I was very skeptical of secular music. Not that I thought that it was all bad, but it was an easy way for me to accommodate to my religious culture to say, here's the stuff that's safe. Here's the stuff where I'm going to have to think about it. So why don't I just stick with the stuff that's safe? Um, I, I definitely outgrew that when I went to college. Um, uh, so, but in terms of how, how we negotiate um, the difficulties here and, and how we develop a healthy relationship with popular art, popular culture in general, and, and with movies in particular. Um, I think of a famous quip from G.K. Chesterton, who said that it is always simple to fall. There are an infinity of angles at which you can fall, but only one angle at which you can stand. So if you want to think about uh, approaching the idea of engaging movies from a healthy perspective, um, it might be best to take a look at some of the unhealthy ways that Catholics engage with it uh, as a way of saying, this is where we don't want to go. Um, and, you know, if you think about angles that you're falling at, most of the angles that you're going to fall at can be classified as either more or less forwards or more or less backwards. And in the same way, many of the ways in which we can engage wrongly with popular culture can be classified into more or less rigorous and scrupulous or more or less laxist and um, uh, negligent uh, in terms of ev uh, critically evaluating any any uh, moral um, uh, content. You and I were raised with, with various forms of, of rigorism, which is, let's be clear, uh, the direction that Christian engagement with movies from the early decades of cinema tended to err. Now, I don't want to exaggerate that. There was always positive and enthusiastic engagement with cinema from the church, from the Christian world, uh, from the advent of cinema. But on the whole, concerns about the corrupting power of cinema overshadowed any appreciation of its positive value from an early time. You can see that in that encyclical from Pius XI that I mentioned, the 1936 Vigilante Cura. You can almost hear it in the name of the encyclical with, with vigilant concern. Um, this was the document that endorsed the establishment of the Legion of Decency in the United States and that set up film review boards, um, not only in the United States, but in Catholic countries around the world. Um, Pope Pius XII um, really advanced a much more appreciative approach to cinema in his to 1955 statements on the ideal film and, and still more positivity has emerged since then. Um, but I think laxity is the error that is more characteristic of our time. 
Um, many Catholics today no longer recognize any moral dimension to their entertainment choices. The, the idea that it's just a movie overrides any moral consideration whatsoever. Um, and um, the entertainment habits of many um, church-going Catholics are indistinguishable from their non-believing neighbors. And that's, that's not really healthy either. So we want to, I, I, think it, I think it makes sense to look at our consumption of media the way that we would look at our consumption of food or our, the people that we associate with or the church that we go to. You know, um, you know, the, the, in, in conservative, um, rigorous circles, there's a, a popular analogy about brownies. Um, and it, the, oh, yes. the idea, yeah. <laughs> you know, the brownie analogy. <laughs> Would you eat a brownie if you knew that there was a little bit of dog poop mixed into the batter? You know, and, and my, the response that I've always come back to that with was, well, I, do you drink tap water? Like, you know. Or even do you drink like filter like Brita, like you, you filter it or you get bottled tap water? Because you know that's not like as pure as distilled water. It's not like a hundred percent contaminant free, right? Um, do you go to a church where the priest sometimes says things that you might not agree with? You know, do you have friends whose behavior you don't necessarily a hundred percent approve of? Let's be clear. Um, there are things that you can eat that will do you more harm than good. There are homilies that, you know, will do more to harm the people who listen than any good that they will do. There is, um, you know, you add a certain amount of, of um, contaminants to water and it becomes unhealthy to drink. But if you insist on perfect water, perfect food, perfect church, perfect friends, you're going to die friendless, unchurched, and quickly. So... Um, I think a similar response to movies is is healthy. We want movies that are healthy, more good than not. And we want to develop that critical habit of being able to identify the thing that we disagree with, bracket it, and appreciate the, the part that is the greater good. And then when a movie reaches a certain tipping point, we're going to say, no, that's not for me. And And to me, that seems like a fundamentally Catholic disposition towards anything outside the church, right? Like there's always this disposition to, um, I think the word of Vatican II was enculturate, but uh, it's spanning the entire history of the church. You approach a new culture and you look and say, where, what's true and what's good and what's beautiful? And let's adopt that and let's work with that. And the things that aren't, well, we can bracket those. We can set those aside. We can, uh, uh, and you know, and the Times in the church, we've been better th with that than other times in the church. But there's still this disposition of, hey, if it's not perfect, we reject all of it. Or rather disposition of where's the good and where's the true and where's the beautiful. Like it's a, it's a searching for, for the gold instead of a, a rejection of anything that isn't pure. Right. And, and, and it's fundamentally rooted in the idea of the incarnation, right? That, that. God didn't just create human nature. He assumed human nature and united it to himself. And therefore, um, there's nothing in human nature, not the corrupted aspect of human, but human nature itself um, that is bad. Um, Tacitus said, I am a man, nothing human is alien to me. And the things that God has created give him glory by doing what is in their nature. The sun glorifies God by shining in the sky and green plants glorify God by absorbing sunlight and growing. And, uh, you know, a, a, a predator glorifies God by trying to catch a prey animal and the prey animal glorifies God by trying to get away. And, and human beings are cultural animals. We are creatures who um, make and enjoy pictures, who invent and tell and listen to stories, who create music and, and dance to music who create images. And, and when you put all of these things together, when you put all of the art forms together, you come up with cinema. Cinema has been called the synthesis of all of the arts because it brings together the performing arts, the literary arts, the plastic arts um, in, in, in one package. It's got architecture, it's got music, it's got uh, song and dance, it's, it's got writing, it's got performance. Um, so so it, is, it is the most modern of the arts, it's the synthesis of the arts, and, and it's, it's an essentially, it's a fundamentally human thing. And when we use it well, it does make us 
more authentically human. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of um, just this past Sunday for the gospel reading, we heard the parable of uh, the wheat and the weeds. And when, when I was hearing that, I found myself really identifying with the servant who went to Jesus and was like, can we tear up the weeds, please? Like, don't you see how much damage the weeds are doing? Uh, and and Jesus' response is essentially, wait, I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll take care of it uh, later. Um, Pope Francis's homily on that uh, was pretty convicting for me. If I remember right, he juxtaposed the desire for purity as an ideological move. It's the ideologue that's, that, that searches for purity. He says, but Christianity is realist. And we recognize that there's always a mix of good and evil with, um, within ourselves and, and our own behaviors and, with, with, uh, and within the world. Um, but we trust that um, God will bring good from it. Um, but yeah, he, he straight up called this desire for purity a, it's not Christian, it's ideological. I, I think of the Protestant background that that I grew up with, and of the the sense in which there were much fewer nominal or or marginal Christians in those churches than there are in the Catholic Church. Um, this is a sort of a symbolism of that in the Catholics that you see kind of clustered in the back pews of the church, and those those back pews are there for a reason. They're there for people who feel that they belong, but they don't want to be noticed. They don't want anybody to shake their hand necessarily or, or try to, you know, get them to stand up and introduce themselves or, or be confronted in any way. Um, there, there needs to be that kind of liminal space. And Catholicism, I think, is very wise in having that, that liminal space that allows people who are not necessarily fully on board to still be at least partly on board. Uh, that's much more not the case in the kind of evangelical Christianity that I grew up with. You were either a hundred percent or you were out. And, and, um, and that does, that seems to me to, to be, there's, there's something slightly inhuman about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the same time though, there, there is a, uh, as you said, it's not a laxity. It's not a complete tolerance of the weeds. It's not a complete tolerance of the evil either. Cause there's a recognition that those things aren't okay. Um, in my own, <laughs> on my good days, in my own moral discernment of the media I consume, uh, my like, m my moral reasoning kind of falls into, in, into two buckets. The first one being, how is this, is this media going to change me in a negative way? Uh, is it going to, um, put thoughts or, or feelings, uh, give me thoughts or feelings that aren't healthy for me? Um, and I mean, that can be like passions and, th and things like that, but also, uh, for example, my wife struggles with postpartum anxiety a lot. So there's times postpartum where, um, she loves, uh, crime mystery shows, but there's times where she can't watch them because it, uh, it puts in her head, um, she has anxious and obsessive thoughts. Uh, she's like, I can't do it. It's like for her own health, she's like, the the those shows or those movies will influence me in a negative way. So for her, her choice is I can't watch those right now. So there's so the first bucket is how the media may change me in a negative way. And then the second is, is my consumption of this movie a participation in um, some evil in some way? So I'm thinking like, well, you mentioned um, there's the writer strike and the actor strike going on. You know, and there's part of me that's thought through, well, uh, is it like, would it be better for me to put a break on the, the streaming that I'm watching? Because that's part of their concerns is they're the actors and writers say they're not receiving enough revenue from um, uh, from from streaming. Um, but also, I think of uh, it may have been Game of Thrones, but I can't say that specifically. But I remember in the past few years, there have been a handful of, of actresses who have come forward and talked about how they have felt coerced into doing into doing sex scenes um, that they weren't comfortable with, but they felt like they had to in order to be a part of it. Um, and that's certainly not something that I would want to 
want to participate in either. So yeah, those two things, how the media is affecting me and then how um, my participation in something that isn't good. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on this type of moral analysis? I, I think that you're thinking along really good lines. Um, uh, for the for the first part, will this content change me for the worse? I would want to classify. Um, I would want want to to have have a number of different categories for art that could potentially have a negative impact on me. Um, there's art that I would never want to consume at all because if I'm going to participate in it at all, it's going to change me um, in a negative way. And uh, that, you know, as as Christians, we think, I think, first of all, of, of uh, depictions of sexuality in that regard, um, especially, I think, for men. Um, the, 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 there has been, in the past few decades, a certain amount of not only mainstreaming of pornography in popular culture, uh, but also a kind of pornification of non-porn culture in, in advertising, as well as in uh, movies and television now. Uh, and that is that is something that can be both, as you know, in your, in your second point, it can be degrading to the dignity of the performers. It can be harmful to the people producing this entertainment for our pleasure. And it can be harmful to us. The Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about uh, pornography as as immersing the uh, all who are involved in an in illusory world um, in, in, a, in a fantasy world that separates us from reality um, and and of of uh, degrading the performers and that certainly is something that you don't ever want to participate in um, but it can also be I want to point out another area in which um, Christians have often been concerned in the past is violence. And depending on how the violence is depicted, um, violence can also be uh, an area of significant moral concern. Is, is the violence um, there to be thrilling? Is it there to uh, allow us to indulge vicariously in revenge against a really bad, bad guy? This is something that I became aware of in the 90s when I was watching a movie and I realized they're making these bad guys do really terrible things so that when the bad guy dies, I will cheer. You know, and um, that's different from making the bad guy bad just for the sake of drama, because, you know, you need to depict evil. Evil is part of drama. Evil is part of the human reality. But when you ratchet up the evil in order to induce audiences to hate the villain and root for the villain's death, that's not something I want to be participating in. Um, I think, for example, of of. Um, a franchise, and I've only seen the first film in the franchise, but uh, the the Sylvester Stallone um, ensemble um, film, um, The Expendables, I thought engaged in a kind of what you might call violence pornography, uh, in, in which the characters were just were defined by how much uh, vengeance or, or how much uh, brutality they could either absorb themselves or uh, inflict on other people. And you have a cup, a pair of the heroes uh, joking afterwards about which of them had the higher kill rates. It, it, the, the, the way that human life and human dignity is treated in a movie like this, I can't brush it off as it's just a movie. I, I think that that does have an effect on the viewer. Um, then there's an intermediate category of films that have caustic, harsh content that's not bad in itself, but you wouldn't want to make it too big a part of your media diet, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I am a big fan of quality horror movies. I love horror movies. Um, um, Robert Eggers' The Witch, I think, is one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. I love vampire movies. The, the Swedish film Let the Right One In is just a fantastic movie. Um, I love Jennifer Kent's The Babadook. Um, in which uh, it's a there's a kind of a metaphor uh, in which the monster is is mental illness, um, but I wouldn't want to a steady diet of horror movies all the time. Um, I, I feel like that would have a negative effect on on my psyche and on my outlook, and and I so uh, you know I think we we think of of Saint Paul in. Um, in Philippians talking about whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is beautiful, think about these things. And he's not saying don't ever think about what is 
false, what is wrong, what is harmful, what is because there is a place for naming and an opposing evil. We we have to do that, um, but but how much of our energy do we want to give to something like that? How much of our time do we want to spend thinking about those things? Yeah, there's. Um... <sighs> I think there's a real area. So that, I mean, there's the boundaries um, and most obviously like pornography where like we, we should not ever participate in this. Um, even as a consumer, we shouldn't ever participate in this, but, but there's most of us, I would say, or speaking for myself, navigate in not the boundaries. We navigate in a lot of the, the gray, like, are the meals that have uh, a mix of good and bad and something that I saw in myself for a while and um, that I see play out every now and then and most recently I'm seeing it playing out uh, and in preparing for this conversation I think I said I don't know if I want to talk about Oppenheimer but now I'm talking about Oppenheimer um, uh, I saw on Catholic Twitter there was some some real there was there were discussions saying um, hey, there's a, and, and I haven't seen it yet. Uh, there's apparently a sex scene in Oppenheimer, and um, there was there there were some folks saying this is pornography. Catholics shouldn't watch this, and then there were some folks saying um, anyone who doesn't watch this because there's a sex scene in it is is just a prude. And my reaction is, wait, can't there be people who are like, for me? this isn't good for me. So I'm not going to watch it. And we don't need to look at those people within to look at those people with any type of judgment. That's prudence and discernment. And other people would be like, um, it's not a problem for me. And that's okay, too. Like, there's a sense of like, what I discern for myself as good or bad, within this gray area, I don't have to impose that on others as as good or bad for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's... <laughs> I, I I love the um, the saying of that I heard once attributed to a priest of the Oblates of Mary in Boston, um, who said that the Catholic Church teaches authoritatively and has always taught authoritatively and will always teach authoritatively that the visual arts are a gray area, <laughs> and and. Um, um, and that's not completely true, but, but there's a lot of truth in it. And there is a lot of room for personal judgment and personal discernment. And there is no obligation for anyone to see any movie ever. Um, there is no obligation for anyone not to say, you know, I don't want to watch a movie where people like, like if there's deadly violence, if it's people getting shot, I'm not going to watch that. As long as they're not saying no one should watch that, no one should judge them for that. If someone says, you know, there's a sex scene in Oppenheimer, there's some nudity in Oppenheimer, I'm not going to go there. You know, blessings on them. I, I think everybody has to draw those lines for themselves. Having said that, there are real concerns both about um, uh, filmmakers being coerced into doing scenes like that. And then also, even if they're not coerced, I think that there are some degrees of physical intimacy between the actors that is inherently contrary to human dignity. And, and this is a very difficult subject. It's very difficult to draw those lines. I did see, I went to see Oppenheimer with my two adult sons yesterday. And um, I, in, in my judgment, the sex scenes in the movie are not pornographic at all. They're not there to be titillating and they are not titillating. Um, the, the second scene, which is very Nolan, uh, at least in, in, the, the way that Nolan approaches this particular movie and its kind of um, uh, surrealness um, is very uncomfortable to watch. It, it's, it's, you, there's, I, I can't imagine the person who would be turned on by watching something like that. Um, and, and, and also the way that the actors interact does not strike me as uh, inherently degrading to, to human dignity. There are some sex scenes in some movies that I do think cross that line. Um, and that I would not want to watch either because it is there to be titillating or because the actors are doing things that I should not be happening between two people on a camera that's being presented to the viewer. Um, but it is very difficult to define where the absolute lines are. These are, these are areas where 
individual viewers need to make their own decisions and we can offer exhortations and opinions to other people, but we cannot make anything a shibboleth. We cannot say, uh, and I, I say this as someone who's never watched Game of Thrones, but I know people who have watched it, including, you know, Christians of a, what I think is a high level of moral discernment and moral, um, um, informed moral opinion who have enjoyed it. That doesn't necessarily mean that if I watched it, I would agree with them, but I'm not going to judge them for their choices. Yeah. 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 I was just having this conversation with someone and not too long ago about Game of Thrones. And I'm like, I haven't seen it. It's the kind of show I would probably like. But for me, like I've heard that the, there's depictions of sexual violence and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to participate in because yeah. Um, to me, that crosses a line even from uh, a regular sex scene in a movie. Um, yeah, I don't think that's appropriate. But again, I know lots of people of high moral and spiritual caliber who watch Game of Thrones, and I'm not going to think less of them because of it either. Yeah, I was just having that conversation. Um, thinking about all of this and thinking about how much movies exist in the gray, I've thought about the past few years because um, my oldest child is 10 and I've thought about how how I was raised and the relationship I was formed to have with especially um, secular media and how I want to do things differently and how I want to help give my kids the, the ability to engage with, to critically engage with and engage in movies in a healthy way th that is neither scrupulous or lax um you your kids are older than mine uh how have how have you navigated this how have you um uh, what ways have you helped equip your own children to engage with media as a, as catholics in critical ways so i think any parents experience a learning curve in this area and in all other aspects of parenting as well. Um, we have seven It's nothing but a learning before. curve. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, we have, we have uh, seven children, four boys and three girls, and the, they run the gamut now from um, almost 11 to almost 29. Uh, and, and I, it, I, I think many parents find as I have found that you start out leaning more on the scrupulous side and you move more to the lax side as they get older, partly because you can't help it. Your, your families, the household culture changes over time. And, you know, I'm not going to introduce this movie to my four-year-old. I'm going to wait until they're seven. Well, that works out great um, until, you know, the seven-year-old is 13 and it's part of their culture. And now you have a new four-year-old and what do you do? Well, maybe you send the four-year-old out of the room. That works out until it doesn't. Um, and and I've, I've, I've had to conclude that, you know, we do the best that we can at the age that we are and at the age that our kids are. And kids are also different. Um, I, among the principles that I have brought to my parenting in this regard is I have never made absolute purity along the line of what I was going to show my kids. I've always been willing to show my kids things that include elements that I would disagree with. And then I just gently point them out when they come up on screen. Um, so for instance, we are big Studio Ghibli fans in this household and we love Hayao Miyazaki um, and movies like um, Kiki's Delivery Service and um, My Neighbor Totoro have been a part of our household culture from the time that our we, our children were very, very young. And, and our, our eldest in particular was very sensitive and uh, gentle, slow entertainment was perfect for her. So there are things in this story that a Catholic might take exception to and that some Catholic parents might be scandalized over. It's a very sweet story about a father um, moving to a country house with his two daughters and the mother's in the hospital. And they, there's a very almost plotless story uh, with this magical element where the girls encounter these um, nature spirits, one of whom is the spirit of, a, of, of an immense camphor tree that looms over the household. It's a wonderful, beautiful, magical film. It's a film that feels like childhood memories. Uh, to me when I watch it. Um, and there's also a scene in which the father, having heard that his daughter encountered this tree spirit, 
um, takes her to the giant tree and offers what you can only regard as a kind of animistic prayer. He thanks the prince of the forest for watching over his daughter and he offers his respects and they move on. And, you know, um, I say what I have said to my kids as we watch this is so, you know, as Catholics, we do not pray to trees. And we don't pray to tree spirits, but we can imagine a world in which God has invented and which God has created um, um, spiritual beings in some ways like angels, in some ways different, um, to, that we might offer reverence and respect to. Um, and this connects with themes in C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, which is very engaged in kind of baptizing pagan imagination, bringing themes from pagan mythology into a Christian context, and then also the Space Trilogy, where he uh, unites Christian angelology and um, Greco-Roman classical uh, of the pantheon. Um, and and it, it prepares the children. It kind of gives them a, a more robust imagination and an ability to assimilate ideas from other worldviews and not just reject something because it's foreign. Another another learning experience for my kids and, and for our family um, and for other families, uh, including some that we're friends with, was the movie Babies, which came out um, 13 years ago in 2010. Um, this was a documentary about four families um, in four very different locations, uh, one in San Francisco, another in Tokyo. So those were the two kind of urban stories. There was um, another that took place in the desert steppes of Mongolia, um, and then the, um, the the desert of Namibia in a, in a, I would say, a Stone Age settlement. So very different experiences. Uh, and, and a very frank approach to depicting the realities of um, a family life of parenting. Um, there, we, we see mothers nursing their babies. We see the um, uh, the kind of day to day uh, um, ethnographic nudity, as as a, a, a phrase that I picked up from the uh, U.S. Bishop's Office for Film and Broadcasting, reviewing another movie. Um, and, and but but you know, not sexualized, not prurient, just just presenting life as it happens in in all of these settings and we went to go see it and we had you know kids of uh, across a broad range and uh, it was i think it was a great experience everybody enjoyed the movie i did hear afterwards um from someone who said that um they went to go see uh the movie and and there was they were they had concerns about the what i called the cultural and maternal nudity um and and that th they were asking questions about you know what, what about adolescent boys is this going to be a concern for them and I was like you know yes it's possible it's possible that adolescent boys who are just exploding with curiosity and passion on this particular subject you know the kind of of boy who in my generation you know we would go to the library and and you know even look at like the National Geographic as as a there's there's um there are naked women and and this is you know when you just when you're that curious and that obsessive about a subject could a movie like babies be a problem yeah potentially does that mean it's a problem for literally anybody else no it shouldn't be and and that's why we brought our kids uh we wanted to show them that this is not something that we're afraid of that this is not something that um we want to treat as shameful in any way and i think it's um you know, those are those are the kinds of decisions that I've tried to make as a parent. And I'm not saying that I've done everything right. And and, and certainly, as I said, uh, my, my choices and my sensibilities have changed over time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that change over time. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing it uh, not with movies, but with uh, the Harry Potter books, our oldest, um, you know, read the Harry Potter books and maybe in like second grade, he started reading them. And I was thinking back, I'm like, there's there's one of them. I think it's the fourth one. Someone dies and it's the series starts getting more dark. And I was like, let's hold off on that one until he's, you know, in third or fourth grade. And we did. But then his brother, who's a year and a half younger, uh, it, it just he read them all when he was in second grade, because that's when his brother in fourth grade was reading them. And um, yeah, there's a real sense of like. Practically, what is actually possible here? Uh 
Yeah, we, we had a, we had a similar experience with the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, I, I at one point had a very sharp cutoff that I would not let my kids start watching the Lord of the Rings until they were something like, you know, 10 or whatever it was. And one time we went on a family vacation and other with with another family and other people were watching the Lord of the Rings. And I discovered to my horror that my four year old child had seen this movie with the orc heads getting lopped off and all of this stuff. And what was interesting to me was that he wasn't disturbed by that. but later he saw a sequence from Spirited Away, another Miyazaki film in which the parents are transformed into pigs. And that, he was just really traumatized by that because you know the idea that parents are not like the stable, secure center of, of his world. Um, and this was when he was older, he was like eight years old or whatever. So, so kids are different, parents are different, families are different and you know families change over time. Yeah. Um... As you know, in our in our last several minutes here, um, I wanted to shift uh, a little bit and talk about, well, yeah, a couple of different questions. One is, um, I mean, really, I want to ask you well, what are some some of the best movies that are out right now? Because uh, th th this summer, for the first time, maybe since the pandemic, I felt, uh, I mean, I've been to like three or four movies this summer, which is more than I've probably been to in the past two years combined. Uh, which has been great. And I know I'm not the only one going to more movies. So yeah, I'd love to hear what what movies you've seen this year that you think are worth not waiting for streaming for. Um, and yeah, I'll start there with that question. Uh, I I have not seen as many movies at this point as I would like to have. Um, had a lot of other competing um, um, demands on my time. But I would say the movies that I'm most excited about include um, the the second uh, Spider-Verse movie, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which I just think is a tremendous film, uh, artistically, morally, um, in, in, in so many ways. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, James Cameron's uh, Avatar sequel, Avatar The Way of Water. I think he's a tremendous talent. And both of those movies are immense spectacles that are really worth seeing on the big screen, if you can. Um, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, which we already talked about. Also, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this franchise, have been for the past 12 years. I wrote a big piece about that on RogerEbert.com, which you can uh, get to at Decent Films. Um, uh, other movies I've enjoyed this year include Creed 3, which is probably not in theaters anymore. Um, the latest from the Jardin brothers, Belgian filmmakers, uh, Tori and Lokita. Um, I have now seen Barbie and Oppenheimer. I would recommend Oppenheimer to anyone who is interested in it. Barbie, I'm trying, I, I'm, I'm still processing what I think about Barbie. Sometimes I feel a lot like Flannery O'Connor who said, uh, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. <laughs> and since since I haven't written about Barbie yet, I'm not really sure what I think about it. And you know, I'm a guy and this is a movie that's for women. And so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to navigate that. Yeah. Um, we took all of our kids. Now we have a eight month old. Um, the a local theater that I was talking about is, is more family friendly. When you're just paying a few bucks for a ticket and it's in the middle of the day, and kids are a little bit disruptive, uh, it's fine in this context. So uh, we brought the whole family, all five of our kids, even the baby to go see the new Spider-Man movie. And uh, it was fantastic. Um, I, <laughs> the first one that came out a few years ago, the first Spider-Verse movie, uh, we, we bought when it came out on streaming. And I watched it so many times that my kids are now sick of it. Uh, I can no longer use the pretense that uh, uh, that they're watching it with me. Um, I'm just watching it. Uh, but I really loved in both of those movies the depiction of family relationships. It avoided tropes that, I mean, they're tropes. They're really common. And uh, I really love the end of the first one when the the character really like comes into himself was... A conversation with his dad uh that was just fantastic and then i really loved in the second one how the parents are working through um how do we be parents of a teenager now who wants more independence and it just felt it felt very real um 
wholesome is a dumb word, but yeah, it kind of felt like that. Yeah, I, I, I've written a lot about the trope that I call junior knows best, which is a very common theme in animated films that depict children heroically rebelling against their parents' rules and triumphing. And then the chastened parent in the end apologizes to the kid. I'm thinking of movies like How to Train Your Dragon, The Little Mermaid, uh, Moana, uh, and uh, Kung Fu Panda to a certain degree. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that's, that this is always a bad thing or that I don't like all of those movies because I do like every movie that I just named. But but this the recurrence of this trope makes me long for movies that show parents having a constructive relationship with their children and having something to offer their children. And it's really very moving to me in the first Spider-Verse movie how the words of encouragement from the father, um, Jeff Davis, to his son at the son's lowest moment, really empower him to rise up and overcome obstacles. I, I wrote a long article about this at Decent Films. And in the second movie, there's an even further twist that's not gonna be fully illuminated until the sequel. Uh, this movie is across the Spider-Verse. The next one is beyond the Spider-Verse in which we see how very differently Miles's life would have gone if it had been his father and not his uncle who died in the first movie. It just gives me chills. So yes, that the moral imagination in these films is deep. And, and I think there's a lot to appreciate about them. Yeah. And the animation is, I mean, I remember when I was a kid going to see Toy Story and how like groundbreaking that was for computer animation. And I felt the same way watching the first Spider-Verse movie. I was like, this is something new. Um, that drew me into the story in a way that animation and I love Pixar, but it drew me into into the story in a way that Pixar has not maybe I'm not sure has ever been able to do, but certainly hasn't been able to do in a long time. Yeah, I, I feel really privileged to have been able to raise my kids in what I consider to be the golden age of Pixar from 1995 to about 2010. And not just Pixar, American animation in general was in a really great place in the 2000s. In the 2010s, it's gone into a, a real funk. Uh, it's just creatively stagnant. Pixar is creatively stagnant. DreamWorks isn't doing anything. Um, a, a lot of other studios, there's just, just nothing going on except for... Phil uh, Miller and and Chris Lore. No, I said that wrong. Um, so let's let's again let's fix that. Um, uh, Hollywood animation generally has been really stagnant in the 2010s, except for um, Chris Miller and Phil Lord, who are in just one film after another: Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, the Lego Movie, um, Spider Man into the Spider Verse, um, um, the. Uh, um, Kate, uh, Katie, the, the Mitchells versus the Machines. They reinvent their look with every film that they do. And the Spider-Verse movies have a visual style that is unlike anything that anyone else has done. And it's it's had something of an influence on other um, other animated films, but, but they're still like pushing the bleeding edge of animation in new directions. And we've talked about beauty as a ray of God. And, and when I watch these movies, it really does offer me something that I haven't found anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I had that same thought when I think Mitchell's versus the machines came out straight to streaming. It may have been during 2020. If maybe, maybe it's 2021. I remember we were stuck at home a lot. Um, and I watched that movie and I don't think I've laughed as much in a movie in a long time. It was, uh, it was hilarious, but then the animation was, uh, was just fantastic. I also overwatched that movie until my kids got sick of it. <laughs> um, as we're wrapping up, um, if there's, so if there's Catholic listeners who want to move out of the shallows a little bit, um, and, and, and engage in movies, uh, or engage in more, not difficult movies, but like engage in a deeper way with, with films. Um, are there one or two movies that you would suggest to like move in that direction for like in engaging with deeper themes? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to 
limit myself to just two or three films um because <laughs> there's a very and you if you go to my website you'll you, you can go to the search page and just search on the movies that i gave a ratings to and that'll that'll give you a great place to start <laughs> um but but oh i don't have a favorite film but i do have a movie that when people ask me you know what's your favorite catholic film and I, the question that i hear is is there a movie that sums up what you believe a movie that if someone said to you, what do you believe? You would say, watch this movie. The movie that comes closer than anything else is Of Gods and Men. This is a historical drama about French Algerian Trappist monks, French Trappist monks in Algeria during the Algerian Civil War in the 1990s and their relationship with their Muslim neighbors, with the uh, kind of insurgents who initially threatened them and then they developed this kind of uneasy truce and then with the really bad terrorists who are a step beyond that. This movie expresses the Catholic ideal at its most winsome. Their community, um, service to neighbor, uh, liturgy, um, sacrament, incarnationalism, um, Eucharistic theology, uh, it, there's, it's, it's such a beautiful portrayal of, of everything that I think Christianity has to offer us as human beings. Um, and the filmmaker is not even a believer. Uh, it's, he's just really attracted to this story. Uh, I would recommend looking at the films of the Darden brothers. Uh, these are Belgian filmmakers. I mentioned them briefly earlier uh, in, in, the, in the podcast uh, from their 1996 movie, La Promesse. Um, one of my favorite movies that they've done is called A Kid, The, the Kid with a Bike. Um, these are filmmakers that bring a real moral focus to the lives of uh, people living in difficult modern situations, mostly middle to lower class, sometimes a criminal element, uh, but with a real empathy and compassion and a, a moral insight that I find in very few other filmmakers. Um, there are other movies that I'd like to mention, but I'll just say very quickly, Go back to the silent era, look at silent movies, look at The Passion of Joan of Arc, uh, 1927. Um, um, go abroad, look at look at foreign films, uh, check out the movies of um, uh, Yasujiro Ozu, um, look, at, look at Tokyo Story, um, make sure that you check out Alfred Hitchcock. Lots of great stuff. And, and you know, if you, almost anything that's a little bit unfamiliar to you, if people seem interested in it, it probably has something of value. So um, just, you know, go where you see there's enthusiasm and you will be enriched. Awesome. Deacon, thank you so much. It was great having this conversation with you. Um, oh, where can people find your work? So um, the home for my film writing and pretty much everything I write is my website, decentfilms.com, whether it's for Catholic World Report or for any other outlet, I always link to it there. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook and Twitter if you're interested and if you're on those platforms. Yes, and I encourage everyone to to, to follow uh, to follow Deacon Gray Donis at on Facebook. Maybe I follow you on Twitter, but I know I follow you on Facebook, and um, I have been enriched a lot uh, from the, in the past several years. So I would encourage everyone to follow him there and to check out Decent Films. Um, I have a closing here that Dominic normally does. So, uh, everyone will have, have to bear with me. Um, thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, if you liked this conversation and you want to, uh, if you like this conversation and want more people to hear it, uh, please like, and subscribe, uh, and leave a review that helps more people discover this podcast. You can visit us anytime, uh, or send me a message at bonefrancisgeneration.com. If you want to go deeper with the types of topics that we discuss in this podcast, uh, also check out Father's Heart Academy. There we're building a community of folks who are looking for um, more compelling discussions um, to, to really difficult questions about the church and about, about God and are looking for some of the deeper richness that the church's teaching can give us. Um, so that's fathersheartacademy.com. And then join us at Smart Catholics, which is the free online community for Catholic millennials, creators, and learners who want faithful conversations, who are unafraid of doubts and questions, and that's free of trolls and ads and toxicity, because Dominic is not afraid uh, to boot people if he if he has to. So that's smartcatholics.com. 
Until next time, say a short prayer for yourself and for us. And remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. Doubts can be a sign that God wants to get, that we want to get to know God better and more deeply. God bless.